Genesis chapter 15 is what we're going to be in this morning, uh, reading a story about Abraham. I titled this morning's message, Something Dedicated to God. So we're going to go ahead and read Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 18. And Wardell, just to let you know, I was about to text you to let you know today was the last day to be a member, and I was going to put your name down if you wanted me to. But anyway, you showed up, so it was perfect time. All right. Genesis 15, 1 through 18. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. Tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. You know, this isn't part of my message, but as I read it, you know, I felt like the Lord was saying, many times we face situations and circumstances like Abraham, and he doesn't understand how the answer is going to come. And he's looking at his circumstance. He's looking at his situation. What does the Lord tell him to do? Come out here and look up. Look up towards heaven. Quit looking around. Quit looking at your situation. Quit looking at how bad the circumstances look. And look up. Look towards me. Because this is part of the message this morning. God is our provider. Amen? Amen. And so he says, uh, and, and so shall your seed be. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. This is another thing real quick. I do this a lot when I'm reading. I stop and do a little commentary. But this passage of scripture is used in the New Testament three different times. It's used in the book of uh, Romans for sure, the book of James, and it's used one other time where uh, Galatians, where it talks about Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. And in the New Testament, it describes how the New Testament believer receives righteousness from God. Abraham specifically believing God according to the plan of God and the result of his faith was that he was pronounced righteous by God. The same holds true for the New Testament Christian. This is what we need more than anything in our lives is to be considered righteous by God. Everything else that you need for your life falls into place once God can consider you as righteous in his eyes. The only way he can consider you as righteous in his eyes is if you have put faith in the plan that he has put together. He's not going to consider you righteous because you go to church four times a week, uh, um, a week. Week, or, you know, I'm sorry, two, two, three times a week. He's not going to consider you righteous because you're involved in all the different ministries, whatever the church has available. He's not going to consider you righteous because you sign up for a membership or that you give your money every time you, you're supposed to give your money. That None of that is going to make you righteous in the eyes of God. God has a plan. Mankind born of Adam is born in sin, and God's plan to provide righteousness for the sinful man is the giving of his son Jesus, who would die on the cross, pay the penalty for sin, and the result of that transaction where your guilt was laid upon Jesus and his righteousness was laid upon you. Now the Father can say, righteous. Now you can be his child. Amen. He will be your God, and because of that you have access to his presence and you have access to his power. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. That's the plan of God. That's how he makes you righteous. In the Old Testament, this promise that God is giving Abraham is the foreshadowing, is the precursor, is the trailer before the, the main event. This is the promise that he's given to Abraham that will be fulfilled through Abraham and ultimately result in Jesus. Amen. 2,000 years before Jesus was ever born. 2,000 years before Jesus ever walked on the face of the earth. God gave this promise to Abraham. All right. He says, and he counted it unto him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees. He, he, he took Abraham in modern vernacular out of Iraq and brought him to Israel. To give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? How am I going to know? You're, you're giving me a promise, God. But how will I really know that this is going to come to pass? Look what the Lord said. He said unto him, take me a heifer of three years old. 
and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now let's just hold on a second. Slow down. Good stuff. God, the, the, Abraham said, how am I going to know that you're really going to provide the promise that I need a promise from you, Lord. You've given me a promise already, but I don't see the fulfillment of the promise. So how am I going to know that you're really going to come through? Go get a heifer. Get a heifer, get a goat. What does this even have to do with? He split these animals in half and he laid them, uh, and he divided them on the sides. And, and in Old Testament times, in ancient times, this was what you called cutting a covenant. So what they would do is they would take these animals and they'd split them in half and they'd lay the two sides of their carcasses and they would make a path between them. Then the two members that were cutting the covenant together would walk through the middle of those carcasses. And what was being said was is that we're in agreement with one another. We're in agreement with one another and whoever fails on their end of the agreement, the same fate should happen to them that has happened to these sacrifices that were offered up right here. And so that's the idea of the Old Testament covenant. This is what God was saying. How do you know that I'm going to fulfill the promise? Because I'm making a covenant with you. Now, one of the things that I want you to see is that immediately once Abraham split these carcasses and did what it was that God asked him to do. I'm calling to the more, this morning's message something dedicated to God. God asked something of Abraham and Abraham was going to dedicate it to him. And as soon as Abraham went to give God what God was asking, what happened? The fowls of the air came down and attempted to steal the very thing that Abraham was desiring to offer up to God in obedience to what God was asking of him. We'll get into those fowls here in a moment. Moment. But I want you to know that each and every time God's making a promise and each and every time somebody desires to dedicate something to the Lord, you can expect the fowl of the air to show up. But it says that Abraham drove when the fowls came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and lo. A horror of great darkness fell upon him. You know, I've never spent a whole lot of time on that part of it. I've always looked at the fact that Abraham fell asleep because it's very, it's very profound in this, in the, in this particular story. What's that? I don't want to talk while I'm outside the camera because I'm going to just call it confusion. All right. In this particular story, I've always focused on the fact that Abraham fell asleep. Abraham fell asleep, and what ended up happening is, is that he didn't walk through the carcasses. Only God walked through the carcasses. The good news about that, and this isn't really part of my message, but it should be, is that God's the one that cut covenant in this situation. What does that mean? See, in the ancient times, both parties would walk through the, the split carcasses. But in this covenant, only God walks through the split carcasses. Why? Because God can't depend on you. Right. Amen. Come on, somebody. Help me out. I'm not talking using the pro pronoun you. I'm saying God can't depend on us. God can't depend on us to be faithful to our part of the covenant. But God is faithful and true. Amen. God never fails. God, hallelujah. God never messes up. He's always faithful. He's always true. You can think you're faithful in your own eyes. You can think in your, if you have a problem with self-righteousness, and many of us do, right? We can think in our own, pride, our own prideful minds, oh, no, I'm pretty faithful to the Lord, preacher. No, you're not faithful to the Lord in all of your motives and all of your thoughts and all of your ways. No, you're not. It's maybe because you have a sinful nature that's still resident on the inside of you, and half the time you and I can't even see how wicked our heart is. Oh, preacher, you're preaching a little too hard. No, I'm just telling you the truth. The prophet Jeremiah said that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The apostle Paul in the New Testament spoke of the fact that my conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. In other words, he even knew. As powerful as that man was, he even knew. Just because I ain't feeling guilty about nothing right now, that's not the plumb line of whether I'm right or not. That's right. The plumb line of whether I'm right or not is whether I have placed and kept my faith in the righteous one. And the sacrifice that he offered to pay the penalty for my sin. If I'm not there, then I'm not cleansed by the Lamb of the Lord. Amen. 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 Praise God. Now look, God cut covenant and God walked through that and God says, I'm going to be faithful. That's how you're going to know. 
That's how you're going to know. All right. So a deep sleep fell on Abraham. He didn't even, wasn't even awake to do it. But even during the most powerful time of his life, one of the most powerful days of his life, a great horror of darkness fell upon Abraham. I've never paid too much attention to that part of it. What you and I got to understand is that, and there's some other negative stuff that's spoken of in here. He said, your descendants are going to be slaves in Egypt. You know, the truth is, is that even in the life of the Christian, and you, some of you have been in this a little while and you figured it out for yourself. Even in the life of the Christian, there's times of darkness. There's times of things that just don't make sense. I don't understand why it is going the way that it is. I don't understand why it's happening the way that it is. Why isn't it going in the way I expected it to go? Well, there's a whole lot of different reasons for that. But there are times of darkness in the life of the Christian. But I'm here to tell you something, that if we would hold on to the Lord, see, it's in the valley, right? That's what the psalmist David said. Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, right? For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God is our authority and God knows where to send us and he knows how to accomplish his will in the midst of our lives. He said, he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that your seed, he's given him a prophecy about the, about the result of, of Abraham's seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not there. He's talking about Egypt. And shall serve them. They became slaves. And they shall afflict them 400 years. That, that prophecy came to pass. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. This isn't part of my message either, but let me just say this. God purposefully allowed Israel to become slaves in Egypt. He said, whenever this whole season is done in their life, they're going to come out with great substance. Mm -hmm. Many times we don't understand why it is that we're going through various things in our life. Can I give you a newsflash for the preacher too and for you also? That there's things in us that God desires to do. There's th works in us that God desires to accomplish. Amen. And spiritually speaking, when we've been through the trial, if we will hold on to the Lord, amen, when Whenever the trial is over, there will be great substance on the spiritual substance on the inside of us that he has produced. Hallelujah. The enemy the whole time is trying to steal it. That's what them vultures are. Trying to steal the dedicated thing to the Lord. The enemy wants to steal from you what it is that God has for you. He says, but in the fourth generation they shall come here again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, the land I'm going to give you, I'm not ready to give it to you yet. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace, that's God, and a burning lamp, that's God, that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto, unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. You know, this chapter right here follows obviously the previous chapter. And in that previous chapter, the story is, is that Abraham's nephew Lot had made some decisions of his own, and we won't get into that. They weren't good decisions. He made decisions based on what his eyes saw, sensual decisions. You know what I'm saying? He was affected by his senses. This looked good, so he made a decision, and it caused really a mess in his life. Well, Abraham with 318 servants went and fought four kings of the east in order to deliver his nephew Lot from this bondage, right? And Abraham was successful in that victory. Now, it was, an, it was a supernatural victory that God had given Abraham. And in the very next chapter, this is Abraham's, this is Abraham's voice to God. How, when are you going to give me my seed? The only seed that I have is this Eleazar who was born in my home, but he's not my child. He was my servant. When are you going to give me my seed? God just showed up and gave you a powerful victory, but here you are uh, questioning God and the promises that he promised you, and you're wanting things to, be, to take place the way that you want them to. And so really and truly, he is experiencing a level of fear because I, the reason I know that is because of what God responds to him. He says, fear not, Abram. He says, I am your shield and your great reward. What it is that you need, I, I can provide. You don't have to be fearful and, and maybe you think those kings are going to come back for you. Whatever it is that you're fear, or maybe you think that my promises aren't going to come true to you. But I'm here to tell you right now that I am your shield, your protection, and I'm your great reward, your provision. 
Whatever it is that you need from me, I am the one that can give it to you, Abraham. You, you, your preacher can't give it to you. Your husband can't give it to you. Your best friend can't give it to you. I can give it to you, Abraham, if you will just trust me in the midst of it all. God gives Abraham assurance that he is what Abraham needs. You know, this has been true for all of God's people throughout the years, right? Throughout the ages, because it's true of all human beings. We have a fear sometimes of the unknown. Listen, people deal with different issues. I have to be honest with you. I've never, I don't feel like I have, and it's only the grace of God. I realize that. Every now and then I feel like the Lord will move his hand back a little bit and I'll start feeling anxious about something, but that's not typically Matt. Even in the, even in the, in the, some of the worst times of my life, I, I can't say that I've ever really felt like I've been stricken with fear on a regular basis. But there's a lot of people that live in fear. There's a lot of people that live in fear and anxiety that they don't know what's going to happen next. And, and because of that, they're, they're always, they don't know what to do. They don't know how, how to trust. And they find themselves moving all over the place in, in various ways and in, in, in various directions. People have a fear of the unknown. People have a fear of how they will be provided for. Abraham, how are you going to provide for me, Lord? I need you to show up in this situation. For Abraham, his only need was to trust God because it was God's promise and he would have to provide when it's all said and done. God can be trusted according to his word. His promises are yes and amen. And furthermore, there are many times that his promises for our lives uh, come true also. In other words, when he gives us those promises, once again, he can be trusted to fulfill them. Let me reword that. God's promises regarding his will and his work can always be trusted because it's the plan of salvation. You understand what I'm saying? God's not ever going to going to balk on that. What's a balk? It's whenever I think the preacher's up the preacher. The pitcher is supposed to make a definite step in a certain direction and he makes an ambiguous step. And because of that, the base runner gets to walk to free to, to first base. My point is, God ain't going to make no mistake when it comes to the plan of salvation. Amen. God is always going to be faithful and true when he is going to complete the work. And that's what he's promising Abraham. See, it, this involves Abraham's individual life. I want a son. But it also involves God's big old plan. And every promise that you might have in your life has to be connected in some way, shape, or form to God's plan. God. Now, many times, this is the reason I want to tell you this. God does give us promises in our individual lives. The promises of God in our individual lives will always line up with God's big plan, though. Sometimes, though, we think God promised us something that he never did. Can I, can I get an amen? <laughs> because sometimes there's things that we want and we want them done a certain way. But God said, I never, I never told you. Don't blame that on me. Don't say I didn't come through for you because I never told you that I was going to give you that. Amen. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. No, you wanted that. You went out and you got that. You grabbed hold of it. Now you got it. You done connected yourself to it, but nobody ever told you to go grab that. So don't come blaming me. No. But God will give you promises in your life. Right. Amen? I preached a message a while back about the unction. You remember that? First John 2, 20. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. And what did we just say that word unction was? It meant anointing. See, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. The presence of God is in you. And sometimes God will give you an unction or he'll allow his Holy Spirit to make something revelation to you. You might be praying about something for your personal life and the Holy Spirit. See, I'm trying to explain to you that sometimes our walk with the Lord is very personalized and very individualized. But you got to understand something. In order for you to really be able to hear that voice, don't walk out of here thinking, oh man, that's what that was. That thought that I had the other day for me to go buy this brand new truck, I knew that was the Lord. Or for me to go do this over here, I knew that was the Lord. It was something I wanted so bad. Hold on a second. Time out. You got to look at your checkbook first. You got to look, look at your bills. You got to find out whether you can afford that new truck. Oh, I knew that the Lord wanted me to go get that new job over there because this old job. Hold on a second. The Lord might not be through with you yet where you were then. Amen. Many times in our own hearts 
in our own flesh, we want things for our own lives and we make our own decisions and our own determinations. Sometimes those are just thoughts that are swirling around in our head. When the Lord gives you a promise, you're going to know it's from the Lord if you are in tune with the Lord and if you can compare it to His Word. The problem that many times we have is, is that we got preachers on TV, we got other pre whatever the case, telling us what God's will is for our life, but we can't compare it to the Scriptures to know. No, God reveals Himself through His Word. God reveals Himself through the Spirit of God and through His Word. Whenever God is going to speak to your heart, it's going to line up with the Word of God. The better you know the Word of God, the more, the more readily and able you are to hear the voice of the Lord. Amen. And the Lord speaks with His voice with an unction or an anointing from the Holy One, and He gives you a promise in your heart then you got to start dissecting all of the things that could be your flesh versus what God is. Because you'll start imagining in your own mind what it's going to look like. Because Abraham later on is going to imagine in his own mind what it's going to look like. Because listen, right now he's thinking Eleazar is going to be the one. His servant. No, Eleazar is not the one. Later on, him and Sarah are going to think Ishmael is, not the, is the one. No, Ishmael wasn't the one. God had a promise in a specific way that he was going to do it. And in the meantime, you're either going to hold on to him and trust him through it all. Or else, guess what? The deal's off. You're going to create your own mess. And you're going to find yourself in the midst of it. And, and, get, and it's not going to work. So God will give you promises for your life. He'll give you an unction. It's something that, you know, and many times, let me tell you another way that you know. It's the Lord. Because many times it's something you don't really want. Yeah. Well, or at least you didn't want it the way, you, the way it was going to be given. Yeah. You wanted it a different way because you wanted it your own way. You wanted to package it up real pretty and put a bow on it the way you like it to be. We all like stuff different. We all got our individual. But God says, no, it's going to be according to my way and my timing. The problem that we have is patience. We don't want to wait on the Lord. We don't want him to do it the way he wants to do it. And we don't want to do it. We don't want him to do it in his time. So what do we do? We just rush things along a little bit. We help him out. I'm going to help the Lord out in this deal. That's fine. You can do that. You have a free will. You can make your own choices and your own decisions. And you can help the Lord out. But guess what? Once again, once you connect yourself to it. And you find yourself in the midst of it. And it isn't what you expected it to be. Don't blame the Lord. Because he's not the one that did it. You did it. That's right. And the more, the quicker we realize that, and the quicker we submit to that truth, guess what? Now God can start giving us grace. Amen. We can start seeing mistakes that we've made in the past. We can move forward, amen, with the Lord. We can be more cautious, more circumspect, more apply more wisdom in the various decisions that we make as we move forward. Bad decisions in the past are not always bad. <clears throat> If we continue to serve the Lord through it all, if we continue to learn the ways of God, why? Because it turns into wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. You take the knowledge of God and you then you start to be able to apply it in life circumstances. Amen? Yeah. All right. God wanted Abraham to trust him, and I can assure you that Abraham wanted to trust the Lord. How do you know? Because Abraham believed God. Listen, you know, I, whenever you look at the, at the map, and I know we draw this a lot, but... The Tigris and the Euphrates were over here. Ur of the Chaldees is over here. That's southern Iraq. This is Israel right here. This, this little area next to the Mediterranean Sea. It's, it's a good, I think, how far is it from home in the San Antonio? Does anybody know? I did the math before. I don't know. It's eight hours in a car. It, that's how far it is from, from, from Babylon to, to Jerusalem. I did the math before, for whatever reason. And, 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 and my point is, is this. Whenever God called Abraham, Abraham listened to the Lord. He packed everything up. He left everything that he knew, and he went on a journey to follow God. God wanted Abraham to trust him, and Abraham wanted to trust God. But if we're all real with one another, just as Abraham experienced darkness on one of the best days of his life, you and I experience darkness too. We become uncertain. Yeah. <laughs> we don't understand how it is God's going to do it, and we start trying to take things into our own hands. Now listen, I don't believe that it shows a lack of faith on Abraham's part that he began to question the Lord. How are you going to do this, God? You know, some people might say, well, what are you doing questioning the Lord? God's okay with people talking to him. 
you, if you have uncertainty in your heart and in your life, it's okay to bring it to the Lord to let him know how you feel. It's okay to say, God, I don't see how you're going to do this, but you know what? If this is what you're going to do, then I want to believe you for what it is that you're promising you're going to do. Amen. Amen? And, and as we continue to trust the Lord, uh, you know, the fulfillment has to come God's way again and according to his timing. And in the meantime... There's going to be a process of dedicating some things to the Lord, right? Until the promise is fulfilled, there's going to be a process in your daily life where you're going to have to offer up and dedicate some things to the Lord. Each and every day, God's going to talk to you about some things that you're going to have to dedicate them to the Lord. Have you ever thought in your heart, today is a new day on this day where God is asking, I'm giving? Have you ever thought of that before? I know you have. Each and every one of us have. I'm going to dedicate this to the Lord. Today's the day. I'm waking up today, and it's not a New Year's resolution. It's not even January the 1st, but I'm waking up today, and today is the day. The Lord's been asking something of me, and I'm going to dedicate it to Him. I'm giving it over to Him today. Have you ever thought of that before? I can't tell you how many times I used to wake up. This was just one thing that I remember in my mind when I used to live with my big sister. When I first moved over here, boy, I was a mess. The Lord took a whole lot of things out of my life, but I still dipped skull, right? And boy, I'd, I'd shove about a can of that stuff in my lip a day, and I was miserable while I was dipping that stuff. I didn't, if you dip skull, that's between you and the Lord. I'm just telling you, I was miserable dipping that stuff because the Lord was dealing with my heart. And every morning I wake up and say, God, today's the day. I ain't dipping again. And guess what? Before the day was over, I would dip again. <laughs> and so what I'm saying is this. Is that that was my heart though. I wanted to dedicate, give that thing over to the Lord. But I kept on failing God. So the truth is, is that each and every one of us have felt that way about certain things. In life. Hopefully for you it's not dipping because that is a kind of a nasty habit. Have you ever pondered in your heart today is a new day? And we already talked about that. I'm going to give it to the Lord. And before we get started, we must understand that the original meaning of this text was. Right? What was the original meaning that God was giving to Abraham? Because if we don't get that right, we're going to miss the whole thing. God had given Abraham a promise that his offspring would be as many as the stars in the sky. Right? And he, he tells Abraham, he says, no, this Eleazar is not going to be the heir. This Eleazar is not going to be the seed. God explained that the servant wouldn't be the heir. Rather, the son would be the heir. So the first thing that we have to come to the conclusion of is that Eleazar doesn't represent the promise. Eleazar, the servant that was born in Abraham's home, but did not come from Abraham's bowels, loins, his innards, was not the heir. Um, he was uh, the result in the result of him. He is he is the first birth that doesn't result in. In an inheritance, but in servanthood or bondage. He's a servant. He, he's not the promise. He's not the inheritance. He's a servant. And servants, for the most part, really are in some form of bondage. Now, we cannot think that servanthood in and of itself is bad. Amen? <laughs> I mean, I, I just wanted to throw this in there. The parable of the talents explains to us that our faithfulness during the kingdom age results in a reward in the end. Amen? Amen? But for this purposes here, I just want you to know the servant isn't the heir. The servant represents bondage. And in reality, a son must be born <laughs> in order for there to be an inheritance. Let's look at Galatians <laughs> chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now, we talked about some of these scriptures a few weeks ago because <clears throat> I preached on the two <laughs> covenants. It says in Galatians 4, 1 through 5. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant. So the idea in this passage of scripture is that the heir is the promised offspring. Let's just pretend it's a physical child who lives in a home where the father's very rich. All right. He has an inheritance coming to him. All right. But he's still a child. And as long as he's a child, he's no different than a servant. He has access to some things, but he can't just take the stuff that belongs to him and do whatever he wants with it, right? He says, though he be Lord of all, one day he's going to be the master of the whole house uh, until the time of a, appointed by the Father. Even so, we, <clears throat> when we were children, Paul's talking about Israel, the nation of Israel, in an infant stage, under the tutelage of the law, 
until the fulfillment of Jesus came. All right? He says, we were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive <laughs> the adoption of sons. This is just a text that shows the difference between a servant and a son. That the inheritance belongs to the son, and that ultimately the inheritance was connected to the son of the father. Amen? Galatians 4, 21 through 24. This scripture we talked about, this is what I actually preached a few weeks ago. It talks about the difference between Ishmael and Isaac, which is really Abraham's offspring. But it says, tell me you that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. He had two sons. Isaac, not Eleazar, but Isaac, uh, Ishmael first and then Isaac. <laughs> The one by a bondmaid, that was Hagar, that was not his wife, that was the Egyptian slave woman that he had Ishmael with. The other by a free woman, Sarah, his wife, who was Isaac. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one which from Mount Sinai, which genders or gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Once again, we covered this a few weeks ago. What is my main point here? My main point is, is that the first birth, Ishmael, represents the first birth before Jesus. In a similar fashion, Eleazar was even before Ishmael. He's not the promise. He's not the inheritance. But God is promising a son, amen, that's going to ultimately be the heir. What you and I need to understand is, is that as God's plan of salvation unfolded through the ages, he sent the heir, which was his son, to produce for you and I to be able to receive the inheritance for you and I to be able to also become joint heirs with Christ. Now, I'm going somewhere because we're talking about access this morning, right? Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. This is the word that the Apostle Paul would encourage us with as New Testament Christians. <clears throat> you know the word Romans is in the New Testament, right? He says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You're not an Eleazar. You're not a servant under bondage. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So what is this saying? This is saying, listen, in the New Testament, when you've gotten saved, hallelujah, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. The Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that now you are no longer under the bondage of the previous life. You are no longer a servant like Eleazar. Instead, you are now a joint heir with Christ. You've become the sons of God according to what the book of John would say. And to them who believed in him, he gave them the right to be known as the sons of God. Amen. Look, at, look, look at John chapter 15, verses 10 through 15. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. This is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. He's saying, I'm about to lay my life down for you. I'm about to go to the cross. I'm going to sacrifice my life for you so that you can experience the love of me and the Father. He says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knows not what his Lord is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father. I have made known unto you. All this in the New Testament, what Jesus is saying. And see, the Apostle Paul gives us further commentary on Jesus' words. All this was made possible because of Abraham trusting in the promise that God had given him. Abraham trusted in the promise that God gave him. And all this came to pass. God had given to Abraham not the servant, but the son is the heir. Through the son Isaac, a nation was born. Through that nation, Messiah Jesus was given. And through Messiah, a sinless sacrifice that converts servants into adopted sons that have an inheritance. That's the meaning of the original text. That's the promise that God gave to Abraham. I hope you're not getting tired of hearing the same thing. I, I'm telling you, every single week I preach the same thing with a little bit of a different twist. 
Why? Because there's one part to this gospel that's never going to change. That's right, amen. <laughs> access to the presence of God remains the same. You needing access to God's presence in order to give you the strength and endurance that you need to make it to the end till the promises are fulfilled in your life is never going to change. The answer was that God has a plan. And through that plan, he gave us Jesus. And as we continue to hold on to the Lord and his sacrifice, righteousness is given to us and we have access to the presence of God. Whatever it is you need on this earth, you have access to the presence of God. That's one part of this message that can and will not ever change. And let me tell you the difference between this church and the church down the road. This is far from a perfect church. Why? Because we've got folks in it. Right. And you've got a preacher that's a human being. Right. But let me tell you something. The difference between this church and the other church is this. The message you're going to hear every week, for the most part, instead of it being you have access to the presence of God through the finished work of Jesus and your faith in that connects you to Him, is going to be you've got to read more, you got to go to church more. you got to be involved more. It's a works-based message that tells you that what you do pleases God and gives you access to grace. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a Galatianism. That is a gospel of legalism. And that is not how God provides grace for you. Amen? That's the meaning of the original text. But in the story, the vultures showed up. Abraham split those carcasses and he laid them to the side. If you can imagine, see, that's what they were. They were vultures, or we can at least say they were carrions. A fowl of the air that eats flesh. In some way, shape, or form, they, certain birds feast on dead flesh. And whatever kind of bird this was, you can imagine, because sometimes in vultures are pretty big, man. They're kind of some nasty looking animals, but they're kind of big, right? And they're kind of waddling along like a chicken, and, and they're grabbing and they're just ripping that meat, and they're over there trying to fly off with things that are too heavy for them. You can get the vision in your mind. And that's what they're doing. Abraham's out there, hey, get away! He's chasing those vultures off. He's, he's, he's shaking them off because he wants to dedicate something to the Lord. I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to show up, but God told me to do this and I'm going to do it. And as soon as God, Abraham tries to be obedient to the Lord, what happens? The vultures show up. The fowl of the air show up. And certainly these fowl are symbolic of the forces of evil. What I want you to know is that the promise was fulfilled on God's part. God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. Amen. Look at John chapter 19, verse 30. When it comes to the first part of this message, the first part of this message, I'm focused on God. I'm focused on God's plan. I'm focused on God's promise to Abraham. And the second part, we're going to make it a little more, more individualized for us. But right now, we're still focused on God's part. What I need you to know is God stayed faithful to his end of the deal. Look at this right here. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said... It is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. Way back when, when God said, through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Your seed will be as the stars in the sky. Abraham believed God and counted it unto him as righteousness. Abraham split them carcasses and laid them to the side. God walked through that and kept covenant with Abraham. It was fulfilled on this day when Jesus on the cross said, it is Finish. The word tilio, it means to conclude, to accomplish, to make an end, to finish, to fulfill. The question for you and I is, what does this even mean for us? Today? What is finished? What is complete? Let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. Know ye, therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. You don't have to be a Jew to be a child of Abraham. Your cultural lineage does not have to come from Israel in order to be a child of Abraham. The point that God, that God through Paul is making in the book of Galatians is that just as Abraham believed God regarding the plan of salvation, you, if you believe God according to the plan of salvation, are a child of Abraham. You are a seed of faith. Think of all of the... Millions of people through the ages that believed like Abraham did and received the salvation of the Lord. He says, The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Right. Once again, Abraham believed God for a seed. Did he have it completely understood what that seed would mean? 
that that seed Isaac would give birth to Jacob and Jacob's name would be changed to Israel and Israel would have 12 sons and those 12 sons would be the 12 tribes and that they would spend time 400 years in Egypt and that they would swell to a great nation and that God delivered them on the Passover night and that he would split the Red Sea and bring them over on dry ground and bring them into the land of Canaan and that land would now be called Israel. Did, did Abraham understand all that exactly when God promised? No, but that's the fulfillment of the promise. And through that, millions of people through the ages have given their heart to the Lord. But what does this mean for you? Faith in the gospel allows you to be forgiven of sin. That's a good thing. That's the best. Forgiven of sin allows you to have access to God's presence and power. Access to God's presence and power allows you to receive God's promises for your life. All your answers for protection and provision are complete in the finished work of the Lord. And in that promise of, of forgiveness of sin and righteousness and access to his presence, there is provision for your needs. I just need you to know that. That the Lord provided for your needs. In covenant with him, there's a provision for your needs. God sees your needs. He sees your desires. He wants to be your provider. But when you dedicate your life to God and certain areas of your life to God, then you need to know that the vultures will come. You need to know the vultures are going to come. When you dedicate your life to the Lord and then certain areas as you move forward with the Lord, you can rest assured the vultures are going to show up. Whatever it is. Certain areas of purity, certain areas of ministry, certain areas in relationships, whatever it is that God has, that, that has, you feel like he's promised you, when you make a decision to dedicate that area of your life, then the vultures will come. The first point, this is point number one. The enemy wants to steal the provision of God and replace it with our own device. What does that mean? I said, the enemy wants to steal the provision of God. God has promised you something, right? God says, I'll promise you something and I'm going to provide it. We're going from the big plan now to your individual life. And whatever it is, you feel like God gave you an unction. If God didn't give you an unction, don't say God gave you an unction because if he didn't promise you something and you go out there and grab it, then you're going to have that big old mess that we talked about. But if you feel like God gave you an unction or a promise in your heart, I need you to know the enemy wants to steal what God wants to provide. And he wants to replace it with really what's on the inside of you. And he does that all the time. Well, what do you do? You got some text for that? Well, I got a lot of stories for that. Abraham wanted to replace it with Ishmael. Do we have to get into that long, drawn-out story? God, Sarah said, hey, go lay with the slave woman and he produced Ishmael. That was Abraham's own doing. God didn't say do that. Jacob deceived his father. God said you're going to receive an inheritance. And Jacob put a first sleeve on his arm and acted like he was Esau. God never told him to do that. He, he, he manufactured that in his own heart and in his own life. Moses killed an Egyptian and buried him in the sand. God never told him to deliver his people that way. That's Moses taking matters into his own hands. That's Abraham taking matters into his own hands. As soon as you desire to dedicate something to the Lord, your life to the Lord, areas of your life to the Lord, the enemy, the vultures of the, yes. uh, of, of the enemy are going to show up in your life and they're going to try to steal what God wants to give you and try to get you to replace it with your own. Satan wants us to get ahead of God and produce our own version of the promise. Okay, But access for us today to receive the promises of God in our lives is available because of Abraham. And in spite of his fear, despite the fact that he couldn't see evidence of the promise, he believed God. He believed God and offered those sacrifices for covenant. He dedicated to God what God was asking. God asked him something. And what did Abraham do? He gave it to him. But when you dedicate your life and when you dedicate heirs of your life, what? Expect the vultures. First, the second thing he wants to do is he wants to steal the word. Really, I had this as number one. I had a number one later and turned this into number two. The enemy, the vultures of God, want to steal the word of God out of your heart. Mark 4, 3, three through 4. One quick verse, two verses. It says, hearken. It means to listen and submit. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. A sower is somebody to take seed 
and throws it in the soil so that it can grow. This parable is a story about the, the gospel being the seed and the gospel going forth. And the soil is the hearts of people's lives. All right. He says, Behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. When you read the interpretation of the parable, we're told specifically that the fowls are Satan. Just as the enemy was trying to destroy the plan of God in the Old Testament when God gave Abraham a promise, the enemy continues to try to steal the word of God out of your hearts, out of my heart today. Because when we have the word of God on the inside of our hearts, it allows us to understand the will and plan of God. The enemy wants the seed of the gospel stolen from the unbeliever. Let's talk about the unbeliever just real quick. You have people that you know in your life that don't really believe the Lord. He wants to steal the seed there. How many times have you witnessed to him? How many times have they rejected him? The enemy immediately swoops in and is trying to steal that seed because he doesn't want the unbeliever to believe and receive the gift of salvation. But he also doesn't want the believer to have the word of the Lord. Because it's through God's word that God reveals, amen, his will and how he works in the life. And, and it's through his word how he teaches us to trust in his finished work so that we can receive access. The enemy doesn't want the believer to know that what God has provided, what is needed, amen, access to the presence of God for the believer to trust God that he will come through. That was number two. The enemy wants to steal the, what God has promised and get you to replace it with what you want. The enemy wants to steal the word of the living God from you so that you are ignorant of what God's plan really is. Number three, he wants to steal the dedicated thing. The enemy wants to steal the dedicated thing. As I was asking earlier, have you ever woke up one morning and said, today is the day that I'm going to give to God what it is that he's asking? God is asking this of me and I'm going to give it to him today. How many times do people want to dedicate a portion of their lives to going to church? This is what I'm talking about specifically. I don't ever preach about this kind of stuff. So all the other stuff might be old, access, and, but it's the gospel. Don't ever forget it. But today we're getting maybe a little bit more individual, a little bit more personal. I don't ever preach about this kind of stuff, but this morning I am. How many times do people want to dedicate a portion of their lives to going to church or learning his word, yet when they do, the vultures come and try to steal the dedicated thing? And what I mean by that, too, is, is I can remember when I first got saved, I didn't know the first thing about God's word. I tried to read. I can remember being offshore, having my Bible out there. Hey, man, you want to come watch? Well, I mean, look, I know this is PG. Hopefully you're at least 13. You know, there's a, such a thing as something called pornography. And I can remember being offshore. Pornographies of the devil. Amen. All right. Amen. I remember being awestruck and people trying to get me, hey, dude, we're watching one of these films. And I'm like, dude, they would just watch this stuff out in the open offshore. I don't know if they still do that kind of stuff offshore. I don't think they do. But, dude, it was bad when I was in the oil field. I'm like, dude, I want to watch that. I'm over here reading the Word of God. And that was my heart. I'm in it. It didn't matter whether you knew I was a Christian, but I still didn't know nothing about the Bible. And I'd do my best to try to take a stand for the Lord out there. And then whenever I'd come in to the beach, as we called it, and it was Sunday morning time, and I was going over there to Twin City. And I can tell you one thing, we might not have had it all right, but that woman sure enough wanted people to learn the Bible. They had Sunday school every morning, an hour before church. And I kept telling myself, I'm going to wake up this morning, and I'm going to Sunday school because I need to know more about the Bible. And all of a sudden, just like on Abram, a slumber fell on my eyes, and I couldn't get up to go. Every time somebody wants to dedicate an uh, area of their life to the Lord, you can, you can bet your bottom dollar that the enemy is going to try to come in, swoop in like a vulture and steal. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That was just going to church. Ch Finally, I'd stumble into church at least. But, but then, you know, that was going to church to be dedicated to the Lord in regards to that. But then also to study the word. People make a determination in their hearts oftentimes and say, I'm going to study the word of God more. And how many times do the vultures of the enemy swoop in? Look at two scriptures real quick. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's talking about going to church. Amen. Amen? Amen. Now, what I want you to know is, is this, is that 
That scripture doesn't say you're supposed to come to church just so you can put your money in the, in the bucket and make the preacher happy so that he has a crowd to preach to. That's not what it says. That scripture doesn't say you're supposed to come to church because, oh, I just know that preacher's always going to whip something up new for me and he's going to keep me happy. I'm going to, I'm, it's going to tickle my fancy and I'm just going to be so excited that I went to church. You don't say nothing about that. As a matter of fact, it says you're supposed to go to church so that you can exhort one another. Your presence in the house of God is an encouragement for others to see that you're still serving the Lord. I'm going through some stuff. Well, guess what, honey? We all are. And you still got to get up and you still got to put your boots on and you still got to get up in the house of the Lord. Not because it's a law, not because it's a work, but because you're not supposed to forsake the gathering of the brethren. It's important for believers, amen, and of like-minded faith, hallelujah, to come together, to believe together, and to watch the gospel together move forward. Right. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. <laughs> Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm talking about vultures that try to steal your time to read the word of God. No matter how you dissect it, it is God's will for you to be in the house of God, and no matter how you dissect it, it is God's will for you to know the word of God. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. But as soon as you dedicate any of those areas of your life to the Lord, the enemy, the foul of the air, is going to want to swoop in and he's going to want to steal it, distract you, move you away from it. Amen? He fights so many people in these areas. When people decide to dedicate, they want to go to the house of the Lord, I want to study, here come the vultures. All right, point number four. This is my last point. 45-minute message, 47-minute message. Verse four. He wants to steal the pl special place in the heart that belongs to God. This is probably the best one out. The enemy wants to steal the special place in the heart that belongs to God. 1 Peter 3, 15. It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The word sanctify means to separate out. God says, I want a special place in your heart. I want to be separated out from all that other garbage that's going on around you. And I want a special place in your heart. And whenever God has a special place in your heart, people around you know it. Why? Because he's got a special place in your heart. And whenever has a special place in your heart, you talk about it. The word sanctify means to separate God is to have a special place in your heart and the enemy wants anything to get in the way to prevent that from happening. Whatever we try to dedicate to God, the enemy will try to devour. There are so many things in our lives that we want to let go of because we know that they get in the way of God's separated place. I can sit here and list off a lot of things. Addictions. I was a whole lot of different kinds of addictions. Some people just want to think about drugs and alcohol, but no, there's a whole lot more than that. That's right. Old behaviors, old lifestyle stuff like that, old clothes, spending money, whatever. Gossip. You know the problem, I put gossip, backbiting, and division in here, but you know the problem with gossip, backbiting, and division is that a lot of times people don't even realize that that's what they're doing. See, the truth is, is that lust problems and committing adultery and doing drugs and drinking, if you're a Christian, you know that's wrong, right? I mean, it's not really that difficult to figure that one out. You know that that's wrong. It's contrary to the word of the Lord. You're just being rebellious in that area, right? But when it comes to these other things, we have a way of manipulating our own minds to justify our behavior. And half the time, we don't even know that what it is that we're doing or that we're causing trouble like that. No. If the Lord's ever revealed to you that what you did was wrong, then guess what? It's just as bad as the addiction problem. As a matter of fact, you're addicted to it. It's just as bad as the fornication problem. It's just as bad as the adultery problem. All of these problems, God looked at it the same way. As a matter of fact, in some verses in the New Testament, he puts all these things together along with murderers and fornicators and liars and gossips and backbiters. He puts it all in the same spot. But in our own minds, sometimes we feel as though we have a right to do what it is that we do. Listen, I'm, I'm closing with this. God made a promise to Abraham and he fulfilled it in Jesus. The promise that he gave results in access to the presence of God. Amen? 
Uh, you can rest assured that when you make a choice to dedicate areas of your life to the Lord, the vultures will come. But like Abraham did, we can make the choice to run them off and protect the precious thing. Abraham's the one that got up and he ran them off. He made a choice to protect the precious thing. You can rest assured that when you do that, the Lord will respond. He will give you grace. He will run to us. He will, he will protect what it is that we're promising. Amen. Let us have your protection today, Lord. Let us see your protection and your provision take place in our lives.